Welcome, everybody. This is Two Ed Tech Guys Take Questions and Share Cool Stuff. Today, two Ed Tech Guys and one puppy. Say hello to Rangely. Hello, Rangely. Excellent, excellent, excellent. Now, what we do in our little, our little shindig here is we work to give you some ideas that might be useful for what you do in classes. We, uh, we, we are appreciative that you take the time to listen to our opinions on such things. We've got some questions for you, I uh, from you, I should say. And for all I know, we'll end up with some for you. Uh, but you should know who we are. My name is Rushton Hurley. I'm a former teacher, former principal, and I run a little nonprofit called Next Vista for Learning. It's an online library of videos by and for teachers and students everywhere. And this is my good buddy, Richard Byrne, who does what? Uh, I write freetechforteachers.com and practicaledtech.com. And I've been doing that for 17 years this year. And I take care of a puppy. As one should. All right. So in that you are you are people out there who occasionally have questions, I know I am one such people. Um, we have some questions that, that we're going to kind of work with today. We're going to start with just some rapid fire ones, because sometimes we get some and we're like, you know, that's that's a quick answer. So, Richard, why don't you start us off and just give us the rapid fire? Rapid fire from Emily. What do you use to make your videos? I like that oval effect that you use. Well, I'm glad you asked, Emily, and a lot of people ask this all the time. I use a tool called ScreenPal. It used to be called Screencast-O-Matic. They recently changed their name. Still the same great tool, still all the same awesome effects, just a new name, ScreenPal.com. Uh, ready for the next one, Rustin? Do it. How do I do voiceovers in Canva? This question came from Sarah. So. The easiest way to do this is just make a set of slides in Canva and then go into the recording studio, which you'll find in the upper right-hand corner in Canva and select present. And when you select present, it will give you the option to go into the recording studio and to record with your voice or with your voice and your webcam. Pretty easy. And when it's done, you can save it as an MP4 file, which you can use anywhere. And third question, third rapid fire came from Anthony. Uh, concerning ad blockers, what's the best way to make people look at your website while not using their ad blocker? Do you do you use anything like that on your blog? So sometimes, when I, for example, sometimes I want to read a news site, a pop-up comes up and says, please turn off your ad blocker. Then I turn it off and I can read the whole site. I just don't know where to start and what they're called. Do you have any advice? Yes, I do. Uh, I don't use anything like that on my blog. I've never really worried about people using ad blockers uh, because I know that most people who are reading my blog are reading it in a school setting, either actually in school or on a school managed device that probably has some manner of ad blocking already built into it that they can't even override. So I don't worry about it at all. Uh, it takes, and Anthony was asking uh, in the context of his, you know, trying to monetize his own website. It takes a heck of a lot of page views to make any money from banner advertising. So unless you're, you know, really creeping up into the 100,000 page views a month territory, I wouldn't worry about it. I don't worry about it. Even when I've got a million views per month on my blog, I don't worry about it. So that's that. Uh, oh, one more question came from Sonia. It seems to me some time ago, you presented a website where students could pr put themselves on a waiting list in the classroom to get help from a teacher. Can you give me the name? Yes. Uh, the tool that I think Sonia was looking for is called Classroom Q, just the letter Q, classroom, the letter Q.com. But you can do a similar thing with Google Forms or Microsoft Forms and just, you know, have students say, you know, fill out a quick little form that says, hey, I need help. Boom. And then you'll see it in a spreadsheet chronologically, or you'll see it in your form responses chronologically, and you know which student needs help. So that's that. Uh, what do you think, Russian? We ready to go on? 
Yeah, no, no. Let, let's let's work with a, a couple of a couple of questions that that we feel might might engage us in, in a little bit more of a conversation. So we'll jump into that first one there. All right. So a little more uh, meaty question. Meaty, not needy. Meaty. Uh, do you have any guidelines for students to follow regarding Chat GPT? This question came from Jeanette. I will start by saying that ChatGPT's terms of service actually say that if you're under 18, you shouldn't be using it anyway. Oh, 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 oh. Oh, did they change that? They changed that in early they March, as a matter of fact. Yeah, they did. They did. So, so now okay. it is, you have to be 13 or older, and it and it says that you must have your parents' permission, which I thought was was a was a testament to the optimistic nature of, of uh, Silicon Valley folks. Yeah, that well. You know, a lot of websites have that. You must have parent from you know, like if you look in the TOS for a lot of things, it says must have parent permission. It, it's and, a it's a cover your posterior piece for sure. Oh, it to totally is. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so get your parents' permission. Uh, <laughs> right. <laughs> all right. I, I think you know, but I keep coming back to the to the old art. It, it feels a lot to me like the old arguments we used to have about Wikipedia, hmm. right? If you can remember 15, 20-ish years ago now, the arguments about Wikipedia, we shouldn't let kids go to Wikipedia because it's full of inaccuracies and yada, yada, yada. And what do we, what, what came out of that was, yeah, kids go to Wikipedia. We, they were going to go to Wikipedia anyway. Uh, and, we need to teach them to fact check it, right? And to look at what's being served up. And you know, one of my favorite lessons of all time about this was, uh, and I think I mentioned it on, the, on this before, was when I was doing some reading on a Red Sox fan's website, Red, Red, Sox, Red Sox fan message board. And someone mentioned this old pitcher, Derek Lowe. And I was like, oh, what's he doing? Now? And so I went and looked him up. And his Wikipedia article said that he had a science journal and he was on writing a, a weekly science blog. So I went and looked it up and went and looked that up. And I'm like, this, this didn't feel right. Like Derek Lowe was not known as being an intellectual giant in baseball. Uh, he was known for being kind of a meathead. And sure enough, there is a Derek Lowe who has a blog on science. There is a Dr. Derek Lowe who has a blog on the science website. I'm guessing no particular not, baseball history for that. Derek not Lowe. the same guy at right, right. all. all right. <laughs> not like, but you know, so you know, I I use that as a lesson with, with students all the time. Like, okay, look at this and look at this. Do these things match up at all? No. So you got to use your context clues. I think that's you know, number one. Use your context clues. You know, know what your prior knowledge. You know, make a list of your prior knowledge before you start chatting. Uh, what do you think? So so. The the really interesting piece to me on this, and and for for folks who might be watching this for the first time, if you go to nextvista.org and contact us and say, hey, can you send me a a link to that course you created on using Chat GPT? I'll send it for free. Feel free, right? Nextvista.org slash contact us. Uh, you'll you'll find it on the site. Nextvista.org. Blah. All right. Now, um, in in thinking about guidelines for using it, um, on the assumption that you don't simply think it's it's something that should be blocked and and you can ignore and it'll go away, which is another testament to optimism. Um, I, I would I would essentially say that the the idea of citations and methods becomes important, and this is actually something that I think was first got out there, at least in my reading, uh, from the journal Nature. Uh, mm -hmm. They say, do not cite chat GPT as a source. And there's good reasons for it. You can't point to where it is. That's not how that works, right? right. Um, if you give uh, chat GPT a prompt today and you give it the exact same prompt 10 minutes later, you'll get a different response, which itself is, is a part of the discussion of what these generative AI tools do. But um, when it comes, and, and by the way, if you are in an IB school, there there is there's stuff there about uh, about you know, hey, maybe you should be citing your sources, and they probably go into more detail. But what you should do is explain your methods, which is different than citing your sources. 
right? So if you are using a generative AI tool to create something, you should explain how that works. And I and I suspect that where we're going with all of this, and, and I think it's actually a good direction, is that our assignments will need to essentially say, how did you start? Did you use a generative AI tool? If so, what prompt did you give it? What did you do with what came back? So you, so you can imagine this kind of rather deep um, set of, of documents that, that explain a, a process in a way that really shows a lot of learning. How did you develop the prompt over time, right? You know, right. revising the prompt within a chat is, is one way to show that you are using these tools in a way that's constructive. Now, obviously, you also have to be very good at exactly what Richard was just talking about, which is thinking through how you'd validate the information it finds. Because the example about Derek Lowe is a perfect one, right? You know, just that kind of thing happens in settings where where the the pre-trained data set uh, is, is the internet up to September 2021, or at least public facing internet. And therefore, you've got the same inaccuracies and biases that are reflected in that data set. Uh, so, so if you think about, hey, what I want my student to do is to be able to use effective tools to be able to, to put things in motion. I started my work this way with this prompt. I took what it what it gave me and did this with it and looked these things up. I refined what I was doing in this fashion. You're like, oh my God, like how long does it take to do that? Well, how long does it take to do the the, you know, kind of give me a one page summary of blah, 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 you know, and, and to do that over and over again over the course of a of, of a semester. And which one is showing more learning, right? That's our real, that's our real question. And the answer is it depends on how you work with what students write. It's not, it's not a given that it's one or the other. Students need to have guidance on how to use generative AI tools because, because they're, they are a fixture of our lives going forward. Uh, and, and I think that I am a long, long way from original in saying that. So, so th that to me is kind of more in the space of what you do with, uh, with students who are 13 and older and have their parents' permission using <laughs> chat GPT. Yeah, and I, I put a, a, a link there Rushton, uh, for Bing, an article I, I wrote called Bing Bard and Search Results. And I talked about the, the importance of context clues. And one of, the, one of the videos that I have in that article is a little demo of me looking up training plans for a 100 mile bike race. If you're trying to prepare for a 100 mile bike race and you want a training plan, well, both chat GPT in Bing and Google's Bard in those videos there, you'll see I tweaked it to say, okay, but my, my, my race is in eight weeks. Can I still get ready for it in that eight week time? And the flaw in that, that I pointed out in the video is that it said, yes, you can modify this plan. However, what it honed in on was the eight week part and not on the training plan part. So anything that, re that referenced weeks, it put in the plan, but it didn't put in, it didn't put it into the greater context. Uh, I'm not doing a great job of explaining it right now, but anyway, the, the point being that it, it focused in on one aspect of my conversation and not the whole context of my conversation. So I had to keep giving it more and more context in order to get to the point that I wanted it to get to, uh, because right out of the gate, it was just like, yeah, you can do this, blah, 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 here it goes, but it didn't have the whole context. And, and so I, I think that context piece is going to be going to be huge. And uh, and good a resource, a very good resource that you put out there. Thank you. Let, let's do the last question and do some shares as well. All right. Let's do the last one here. Um, from Janet, I want to have my class create a yearbook for the end of the year want every student to make their own page, but also work on class pages. What would you recommend? I'm thinking about Google Slides as the easiest, but I want something that's a little more polished. Uh, my first thought would be to use Canva because Canva has uh, you know, a lot of collaboration tools and a ton of templates. Although as I think about it more, depending on your students, it might actually create more work than not because you have so many templates and so many kids trying to use so many different templates that you might spend a lot of time walking them through. Okay, 
the editing process because because you want to have some some cohesion to it. Uh, you know, you you know, you I'm all for having kids express themselves a bit, but if you're trying to end up with one kind of cohesive product at the end, if every kid has a different template and every page has a different format and layout, it might just look like an unwieldy kind of mess at the end. Uh, so maybe if you use Canva, say, okay, class, we're going to use this template and share that template with the class. But I, yeah. I like Canva. Uh, Canva has also has a lot of uh, you know external printing options. So that's good. Uh, yeah, Google Slides would work. I just think it'd be kind of that blah. Uh, <laughs> what do you think? So, uh, you know, I, I think that that anything where it's, it's easy to pass material back and forth between between different files. So like in Google Slides or, you know, Office 365 or whatever it may be, yeah. um, you know, that simplifies a process. I, I, you know, he seemed to be looking for a little pizzazz. I would yeah. say that something like Book Creator, where you're able to, you know, kind of show these different things in, in kind of interesting ways, you know, that if, if you play, you know, you can be like, ah, there we are, right? And then it turns pages, you know, that, that's all kind of fun. But that you can add like audio things easily to to what you do is is pretty cool. Um, what what I think about though with something like this is the purpose, right? Always be thinking, hey, if I have uh, students who are who are showing their learning, can they take it to a next level? Can they can they take the the thing that they learned and say something else about it. So no matter what tools you use, can you show that you're you're you've learned something and you're applying it in some way to how you think about something else you've learned or something in your life? Uh, that's that's what when I'm looking for, you know, what I'm looking for when I when I work with teachers about say end of year projects is, you know, that's great. Is is that something that people would expect or are they adding some piece of distinction to it that's interesting? Yeah. Well, I, 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 the, I'll just add the piece uh, you kind of mentioned there, the, the multimedia fa factor of it is if the end goal is to just print it, you know, that makes it a little simpler. Mm. If, you're, if your end goal is to print it and publish it online in some format, that makes it a little more complicated because mm -hmm. then you have to talk about, okay, what are kids including in this in regards to privacy and where are you going to publish it and, you know, who's going to be able to access it. So there, there are other factors in, to consider in that as well. That's right. There's, there's a long history of, of trying to figure out exactly what the, you know, the right way to do this thing is. And speaking of history. Oh, see what I did there. Right, right. That is a heck of a segue. <laughs> Uh, so this is a cool new app called Hello History. You'll find it at hellohistory.ai. Uh, and it lets you chat with historical figures. Uh, there's about 400 of them. You can chat with people like Abraham Lincoln or George Washington, Che Guevara. Uh, lots and lots of lots and lots of people that you can chat with. Martin Luther King Jr., Elvis Presley. And it's pretty cool. Uh, I've been playing around with it. You can go in and, you know, ask that person about their life or about events that they lived through, uh, and they'll chat back to you. Now, every time you do it, you get, I've done it a few times, and every time with the same person, you'll get slightly different responses uh, because it does try to personalize, I guess, a little bit uh, every time you, every time you do it. And, you know, like anything else that's powered by AI, there are uh, some limitations and some fact checking that you're going to want to do. Uh, but I think it's an interesting way to get students to, you know, be a little interested in history. I agreed. I, I will. I, I am kind of intrigued by the, uh, the the thumbnails they've got of all of these folks. This to me looks like the, the scary movie version, actually, of Queen Elizabeth, who I, I, I <laughs> kind of think of in, in far more, you know, like kindly, kindly ways. But there you go. All right. Well, my share actually has to do with a, a story, as as you may know, you good viewer, uh, there are there is a weekly series of prompts that I put out. So it's a page. And what it has is it has a video on it that I think is a is a really interesting video. In this case, 
It's a troupe of dancers, all of whom are deaf. There's actually uh, an, an, an accompanying uh, musical group, all of whom are blind, right? And so how they work together to do the things they do is, is both fascinating and inspiring, right? Uh, and so what I do on these these pages is I'll, I'll add uh, I'll add prompts that you can use for homework or writing discussion whatever whatever it may be. Uh, you'll find that there's there's a whole bunch of these things that I've been putting out weekly for for some time. And the most recent one here has to do with Angkor Wat, which is a place that was on my bucket list, and then I got there and it was amazing. And there you go. So lots and lots of cool things that are out there. And given the amount of like negative stuff in the news. Kind of nice to get something, you know, like a little more uplifting. Speaking of uplifting, caffeine kind of does that for me. And if you, uh, you know, if you sign up for my newsletter, you might win a Starbucks card. Actually, it's not signing up for the card, the, the, the newsletter that does it. Actually getting into the newsletter and identifying what the little challenge is that'll usually take you somewhere between 30 and 60 seconds. And then putting your name in, you know, via the way I tell you and boom. And I'll tell you, I don't, I don't get a lot of entries on this. Is that because nobody reads your newsletter? Boy, I hope not. Um, but, uh, you know, there's there's just plenty of good stuff in the newsletter. So feel free to give that a look. Um, I've written some books. Feel free to look at that. Contact me if you're curious. Happy to talk to you about it. And speaking of good books, he said, referencing his own books as good, and hopefully they are. Um, yeah. Richard, what, what do you got here? Uh, check out my sign up for my newsletter. I'll send you a copy of the Practical Ed Tech Handbook, uh, 50 some pages of my favorite ed tech tools and tips of the last year. And you can check out my YouTube channel if you like and see me making lots of screencast videos of all kinds of things, including Hello History. Does, does Rangely appear in any of these videos? Rangely does not appear in any of them yet, but he probably will. Uh, it's to get him out of the garbage can. I, 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 I hope that, that that is certainly how that goes. Well, thank you, everybody, for watching this. You have you have uh, spent some, I don't know, 25, 30 minutes, whatever we've been doing here, uh, you know, hanging out with us. And we hope that you enjoyed it because we enjoy doing this. And, and if it helps you as well, all the better. May you inspire and be inspired daily. We will see you again.